Bueno, son las dos. Eh, hello everybody, I'm Pepe Zamorano from Madrid and I'm sitting here in the University Hospital Ramón y Cajal eh, with Covadonga Fernández Golfín, our head of imaging in the University Hospital and with uh, our friend Roberto Lang in Chicago. Uh, so welcome to this new Monday Imaging Talks. Today we are going to uh, chat about the right ventricle and the right ventricle no doubt is challenging. So we will start with Covadonga that we, she will present a clinical case to Roberto and then we will start uh, our chat with all of you. Remember that here we have two main or two principal uh, people here. One is Roberto and the second one is all of you and we are waiting for your uh, questions and chats directly to Roberto. Covadonga. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Roberto. It's our pleasure to have you here and to be able to discuss with you issues and doubts uh, about uh, right ventricular evaluation with echocardiography. Uh, Pepe just said it, but please feel free to write down in the chat all possible questions uh, you will have uh, about the topic because the idea is that we can translate all those questions to um, Professor Lang, so he will answer, uh, we will answer uh, as much as, as we can. And so when, when preparing for this, uh, this uh, imaging talks, we, we thought that it would be nice to present uh, a first case, uh, a case we just had uh, uh, last week, we were discussing is the case of a 72 year old uh, female that was being evaluated to, um, for uh, a left ventricular assist device. Uh, as maybe we can go to the first, uh, first slide, uh, which is uh, the one, uh, we will start just presenting the images because the, the issue with this patient was and we have uh, in, many, in many of these patients decide if the, the, the right ventricle is uh, is enough to, to go for the LV, LV assist uh, device. Uh, and so I don't know if we are having some trouble with the, with the presentation, um, but uh, we will see in a minute. So this is a woman with, uh, with the normal coronary arteries, left ventricular, uh, severe left ventricular dysfunction. And uh, as you can see here in the four chamber and uh, two chamber view, I don't know if we can be can see the videos moving. Um, for some reason, we are having some trouble. You can have it there. You see, this is just to have a, an overview of what we're talking about. The patient, she had normal coronary arteries, but she had undergone a, a, a cardiac MR a few years uh, before, and she had a, a, a scar in the inferior inferolateral walls. Maybe we can go to the, to the next image. Can we go to the next slide? So we have a, a left ventricular ejection fraction, 3D ejection fraction of 26%. Uh, this is the, the 3D uh, automatic quantitation of the LV ejection, ejection fraction. So you have an idea. And if we move forward to the next slide, we can start focusing on the, on the right ventricle, which is something um, always uh, challenging for the uh, echocardiographer. This patient, she has a, a defibrillator uh, implanted uh, a couple of years ago. And I'm sorry that the images are not moving so well. Uh, as you can see here, this is a focused right ventricle uh, view uh, in order to assess uh, morphology and, and function. You can see that the right ventricle is not so dilated, just mildly dilated uh, when you do the, the measurements, but uh, the impression is that uh, it's not moving uh, so well. Um, if not, we can move to the next slide maybe. Here we have uh, another image of the, of the right ventricle. Uh, we have uh, different parameters that uh, we can use. We have TAPSE, which was very reduced, around 13. And we have uh, uh, DTI systolic velocity, also, also uh, very, very low. Uh, a fractional error change was also low, around 20, 23%. We can move to the next slide. 
We perform traumatic strain evaluation of the right ventricle and we go to free wall of uh, minus uh, 15 and um, right ventricular uh, uh, strain of uh, minus 10. Uh, and also we perform a 3D evaluation, uh, automatic quantitation of uh, 3D uh, ejection fraction. Can we move to the next slide? Please, which is I think is the, the last one. This is the, the, the position of the of the right ventricle with the with the 3D heart model um, software. And if we can move on to the result. Move on to the next slide, please. And we got an ejection fraction of 27%. We performed different acquisition and different measurements, and, and it was more or less around that uh, that number. So here we are. Um, the impression was that the right ventricle was uh, a very poor. We perform a, a, a right cath, and the hemodynamic profile of the patient was uh, was very good regarding uh, pressures, uh, pulmonary pressure, and right atrial pressure. And um, I don't know if you want to make. Um, some comment, Roberto. Uh, how, do you yeah. feel, how do you deal with this type of, of patients that uh, sometimes you have to do a lot of measurements and, and at the end you have to decide, we go forward or, or, or we cannot and we have to, to plan uh, some other approach? Well, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be talking with such good friends for so many years. So I think you have made a, meaning quite a, a beautiful uh, evaluation in this patient of, of the right ventricle. Uh, I think that, you know, when we, when we talk about assessing the right ventricle, it's always a, a little bit complicated and we read about the, the crescentic shape of the right ventricle, et cetera. But, you know, we could talk a little bit about all the different measures, but, uh, you know, in this, in this study, the first thing I, I would say that I always like to tell people is that you have made the right ventricular focus view. And I think that is something that a lot of people don't do. Uh, and I think it's relatively easy to do from the apical four chamber view. You move the transducer laterally and, uh, and then you sort of change and you rotate until you get the base of the right ventricle uh, as large as you can. <clears throat> this is the view in which you have to do all the measurements of the base of the right ventricle and the right ventricular strain. If you do measurements in, the, in just a regular apical four chamber view, measurements will be different. So here you got very consistent measurements, all the measurements that look at longitudinal function either of the entire free wall or just of the base of the septum were all uh, reduced. Interestingly, uh, the right ventricle did not appear to be dilated. And uh, at the time in which, you know, the hemodynamics of that ventricle, as you hinted, were pretty good. And you're gonna think about uh, in, in LVAD maybe in this particular patient, to do assist device, I think it's it's sort of potentially complicated if you would also at this point in time go and do a, an RVI. I think in our hospital they would probably just uh, do the left ventricle if that is uh, required. Um, Roberto, uh, here is Pepe. We have here one question for you. Uh, for the right ventricular evaluation. Is TAPSI enough? Is a strain enough? Is 3D the answer? Well, that, that is a, it's a loaded and good question. So I think we need to think about it a little bit. So, you know, I would answer you by telling you that you very well know that the right ventricle is essentially divided into three parts. You have an inflow, then you have a very trabeculated apex, and then you have a, an outflow. You know, when, when you measure strain and you measure the S wave, you're just measuring longitudinal motion of one little point of the right ventricle at the base. And uh, so as such, it, it has limitations. The, the major limitation 
that I have found, and we're actually even writing a paper as we speak about it, is that strain and the S wave can give you a very discordant value with MRI, particularly if you have a lot of tricuspid regurgitation, because the tricuspid regurgitation can create some sort of movement of that area, but the whole ventricle is not moving. Accordingly, I think in all the labs, and you showed it very beautifully, people have shifted to do right ventricular strain. Right ventricular strain, particularly of the right ventricular free wall. Now, we need to think about it. The orientation of the fibers in the right ventricle are different to the left ventricle. In the right ventricle, most of the subendocardial fibers are longitudinally directed. So to do longitudinal right ventricular strain uh, is, is a good idea. The problem and the, and the good thing about strain is that strain is maybe less dependent than ejection fraction. Uh, the strain, part of the issue of the, of the right ventricular strain is that you're not measuring nothing that has to do with the outflow portion of the right ventricle that is not being assessed. Ejection fraction, on the other hand, takes account everything in the right ventricle. Uh, part of the problem with, uh, with, of all the chambers, the right ventricle is the most difficult to do. In this case, you had the, you know, the heart model work beautifully, but that does not seem to be the case consistently in, in, in all patients. So you really need to know how to acquire that. Ejection fraction seems to be a good thing. It's very low dependent and it is more complicated to happen. So I think a, a combination, I personally think that the TAPSI and the S-Wave are really very poor measures. They are good because you can do it very quickly, but they are very limited in the information they're provided. And I think that eventually we will all be moving to using commonly right ventricular free wall strain to assess the right ventricle. Uh, okay, I think it's clear. Uh, Koba, do you have a question there? Uh, yes, uh, do you think TAPSE and, and DTI, do you think um, in all patients or, or do you think it could be because when we talk, maybe a lot of people are watching us and, and TAPSE and DTI, they both uh, are easy to perform. And we also have to think about uh, when talking about this, um, these parameters that not all people have all technology and we need to, to do something or at least to, to not rely on our subjectivity in order to assess um, RV function. Do you think it could be useful as a rule out, rule in a right ventricular dysfunction? And, uh, and also maybe we could select those pathologies in which it is not useful, this uh, TAPSE and, and, and DTI. Uh, I don't know if you have a, a thought about that because... Um, yeah, no, I, I, I understand that, you know, usually, but I would make the, the contra argument to what you are saying is that now with all these uh, AI methods and so on, to get a right ventricular strain is as easy if you have the equipment, of course, than to do a TAPSI or to do an S-wave. If you know the limitations of TAPSI and S-wave, I think the major limitation is the presence of TR. Uh, and also to understand that you're measuring just one little point of, of the right ventricle. So yes, of course, it, it, it can be used. But if you look into the future, I think that the right ventricular strain, I, let me tell you something else. For example, if you take 200 patients and you compare the ejection fraction of the right ventricle that you get with cardiac MRI, and you compare it uh, in a regression with, with TAPSI or the S wave, you will see that uh, that correlation is not very good. But if you correlate it with right ventricular free wall strain, you get a much better correlation. So yeah, if you don't have the equipment, I, I totally get it that, that definitely using TAPSI and the S wave is better than nothing. Um, I think fractional area change, for example, is very complicated because people, you can, it's very difficult. You have to have a fantastic lab to be able to use fractional area change serially in patients. Because usually that's measured from the apical four chamber view 
and the cut from which you get the right ventricle changes from from patient to patient. Okay. So yes, the, in order to make your question short is, yes, you could use it, uh, but you have to know the limitations. And as we all try to advance, right ventricular strain will be the way to go. And uh, Roberto, we have here a, a question from Tony. Is now that we are using the right ventricular focus view, what is the upper limit of normal for right ventricle basal diameter? The previous oh. value of 42 is true for the normal four chamber view, which is different to the right ventricle focus view. What is your view on that? Okay, that is a, that is a, a very good question. And uh, when we wrote the, the guidelines, you know, the last guidelines were written in, in, in the year 2015 and the previous one in, in the 2005, and I think that you, you were part of those, um, the guidelines still are not very strict in recommending the RV focus view. But uh, in the next, if there ever, whenever there is a new guidelines, me, we, we did a study lately in which we compared measurements in the AP4 chamber view and in the RV focus view. The RV focus view, the measurements are larger and the strain is also higher. Uh, in the meantime, we still use the measurement of the right ventricular base of 42, irrespective, but because we still never has, nobody ever has sat and looked at a group, you know, I, I think maybe the, the Norre study that was done in Europe and maybe the WASE study that is done in the United States will allow us to make measurements only on the RV focus view. And uh, uh, Roberto, in this, in this setting, uh, do you think that since the right ventricle is more difficult to evaluate, will heart model uh, be more efficient or more needed in the right ventricle? Yes, I, I mean, of course, it, it would be great, but uh, I, I know that I mean, your group has a lot of experience with that, and we have done studies together on these things over the years. Uh, if, if you take, this is my opinion, I'll, I'll ask uh, the opinion of, of Ramon and Cajal. In my opinion, if you take 100 patients that come to an echo lab, right? And in the United States, we have more obese patients than in Spain. Uh, I think you can do the, the, the right ventricular sided uh, uh, heart model will work maybe in less than 60% of the patients. So it is a, it is a good start but I, I still think it's, it's, not, uh, it's not exactly for everybody. Okay, uh, I think Kovadonga is showing some images now. Kovadonga. Yes, um, uh, I totally agree with uh, you, Roberto. Uh, right ventricular uh, evaluation and even the 3D evaluation that we try as much uh, as we can uh, and hard to get the, the nice images is not so straightforward and um, probably you have to do some more editing and, and that uh, that is important in order to do the, the follow-up uh, of our patients. Um, I would like to know uh, how do you do the, the follow-up of, of patients in which right ventricular function is essential? Do you use uh, just echo, echo, and MRI? Uh, do you rely in, in one parameter uh, above uh, the other? Do you do a comprehensive uh, assessment that sometimes is what we all do when we don't have uh, everything? I think uh, MRI has a, I mean, is of course useful and the MRI has become over the years the, the gold standard to which we compare. And when we do 3D echo compared to MRI, we underestimate slightly the volumes, yet the ejection fraction is relatively accurate. Uh, regarding the other uses of MRI for the right ventricle, it is a little bit more complicated, particularly because the, the, the right ventricle is, is, the thickness of the right ventricle is, is small between three and five. So, um, you know, I, I think that we seldom use MRI to assess LV function, we use usually echo. And, and then, you know, for the other, the, the pre-contrast T1 weighted images uh, with and without, we can use for, you know, for SAT 
fat saturation or fat infiltration in the in you know ARVD that you see in Europe much more frequently than what we see here in the in the United States. And then with uh, you know with contrast delayed enhancement a little bit for fibrosis or fat or infiltration, but we don't use MRI frequently to assess the right ventricle. So so let me let me jump there, Roberto. So from the clinical setting, uh, when do you send a patient for MR? In which clinical decision making? In 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 view of evaluating the right ventricle. I mean, maybe in in which setting? Well, I I would say maybe a setting would be that you get very inadequate echo uh, quality images. Um, you know, in the in the cases of uh, ARVD, and of course, in all the cases in which we assess the left ventricle, but I don't see that we frequently send patients just to assess the right ventricle. You know, if there is a particular tumor or something that is complicated, but re in the regular clinical day to days, I don't think that we uh, send patients for just to assess the RV. And and uh, in in a, in a patient with left-sided heart valve disease, um, how do you evaluate the right ventricle in the presence of uh, pulmonary hypertension or in the absence of pulmonary hypertension? Any corrections with that? Um, well, we do the, the complete... Hem Are you talking with regard to an MRI study or with... No, no, with, with, with the... The... Uh, no, we, we try to get uh, most of the most of the hemodynamics, um, but we don't do nothing in particular. Meaning, we have a little bit more of a. Uh, it's slightly different in, in Europe and in the states. In the states, because you have sonographers, you can spend much more time, right? With uh, you I mean you we in my we a lot one hour per patient to do an echo. So you imagine you had to do that in Europe and your physicians, the only thing they did in a day was acquire eight echoes. It, it, it won't, it wouldn't work. So, you know, that leads to differences in the people acquire consistently, but no, we don't do any, any particular, you know, we might, you know, sometimes we try to measure the acceleration time on the pulmonary artery and we, we try to get good dopplers, but nothing in particular. Kovalonga, uh, do you have? And about strain, um, which uh, in your opinion is, is one of the parameters that uh, would be now that we can perform it uh, more easily and automatic and it seems it, it actually it, it works uh, very nicely. What kinds of values do you do you normally use? Because we have we don't have as much information yet as we have for the left ventricle and and uh, and we have some uh, values in the guidelines are those the ones that you used you have uh, that that is a, another good question because when the last guidelines the you uh, these are combined european american guidelines uh, of 2015 that was sort of the not the beginning but strain was not so commonly used so we tried to create some normal values and that created a lot of discussion among people because this is, it makes the, I always laugh and say that it makes the Israeli-Palestinian issue a, a small issue compared when people get so fired up about strain. But uh, the, the, the number that we, um, that we thought, or, and, and I think it was not very wrong, was minus 20, uh, both for the left ventricle and the right ventricle. There are of course differences between vendors and the Europeans and Americans have done very beautiful studies trying to show the, the difference between vendors. These differences are becoming smaller uh, and smaller. And uh, I just, we just finished doing a, one of the, you know, we, we did a similar study to the Norris study. There was a study and, and I think we got minus 22 or something like that. So I think an easy number for people to remember is minus 20. For yeah. both uh, the free wall and... Uh, no, when you, when, no, 
That's a, good, that's a good question for the free wall. When you add the, I don't see us using, I don't know what, what your experience is, but we, we acquire the right ventricular free wall and the septum, but we never use the septum information very much for nothing. So we use mostly the right ventricular free wall. Okay. Uh, Roberto, we have a question here from uh, Jorge regarding echo monitoring. Are there significant discrepancies between the strain measurements with equipment from different commercial companies? Okay, well, that is, a, a, I mean, I have most, I work mostly with one vendor, but uh, I understand that the differences, particularly between GE and Philips, would be the most uh, traditional vendors, are now not very, very uh, high. You know, the, the Philips, uh, is using all the TomTech uh, uh, sort of software that existed before. And that works very nicely. I, I think uh, I'm very happy with it. It works very consistently. And uh, I don't think that there are major differences between vendors uh, in terms of, of the numbers. So I don't know what your experience is, but I, I think uh, that these studies have shown that most of the vendors come with a very relatively good number. Yeah, I would like to, to uh, bring up something that we are, uh, that we all know that happens with the right ventricle, uh, which is the, the low dependence of, of, of even the, the size and even the function. Uh, we are seeing this in a structural heart disease interventions that we do the measurements and everything and then we get to the cat lab and uh, it's changed uh, so much. Um, I don't know, do we need to perform in order to make decision in these patients, not in, for example, tricuspid regurgitation, probably it's more than, well, also in tricuspid regurgitation, which is what we do in the cath lab. Do you have a, do you do it no matter the, the loading condition of the patients or do you take into account this in some way? Because we are astonished when getting the device and we change the size in the cath lab, which is something you think about i mean you're that what you're describing happens to us happens to everybody you know we we make a diagnosis of a moderate severe tricuspid regurgitation we go to the cath lab of the operating room and the blood pressure is lower and then the values drastically change as well as the measurements i don't know that we have a solution for that other than understanding you know usually the surgeons get to see things with the, with the, when the blood pressure is in the 60s. So they, you know, it's, it's very different. So I, I think that's a, that's a huge problem. And that's why I alluded at the beginning that the best measure uh, or the one that is less low dependent is, is strain. Ejection fraction is also extremely, extremely dependent. And if you would do a study looking at the uh, right ventricular basal diameters or the tricuspid annulus, and you would do it uh, in, in normal conditions and when there is a, a low blood pressure with, a, with decreased preload and increased afterload and so on, you will see major differences. Uh, Roberto, now we have a lot of um, in, invasive procedures in the tricuspid valve. In fact, uh, we are mainly doing cardio band in the uh, TR, and uh, we do see some difficulties in assessing the right ventricle after a prosthesis or a device. Uh, how you solve that, or any recommendation there? Uh, yeah, because yes, it, it, it's difficult because you know even when there when there is a lot of either catheters or metal or whatever, it becomes very very complicated to do these uh, type of measurements. We try to do research on patients with uh, right ventricular assist devices and it's almost virtually impossible to get measurements that you would, uh, or to use the heart model or anything like that. Um, so I, 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 the only thing I can, I can tell you is that maybe you, sh maybe obviously from the transthoracic point of view, uh, probably going to a right ventricular focus view or going to the one that is called a right ventricular modified view uh, 
which is from the position of the focus view, you rotate to try and expand the right ventricular free wall. Maybe in those type of situations you can see, but no, I, I don't have any major secrets other than trying different windows to see if you can, if you can get your images. I think we have a question from, uh, from Rocio here from, from Madrid. At this moment, uh, do you think RV evaluation by ECHO is reproducible between different operators? Do you say it's RV qualitatively, subject, subject, uh, subjective as well? Well, that is a very good question also. Um, I think that, uh, as you definitely know, we, there is a way to, to subjectively assess the right ventricle, if it's large or, or not large. And we always like to look at the apex of the, of the left ventricle. And if it's occupied by the left ventricle, then the right ventricle is not large. And when it occupies, when it's shared, or when it occupies it, we say it's milder. So there is definitely a subjective way of doing it. And I think people who are experienced would be pretty good at doing it subjectively. Quantitatively, then things become very, very different because I think it depends what, first of all, it depends on what view you're making the measurements. And I think that this issue, we all talk about the RV focus view but in the RV focus view, forget about the left ventricle, zoom on the right ventricle, do everything. People don't do that consistently. And if, if you are doing a study in one view and I'm doing it from another view, we will never be consistent. So I think the most important thing is to have a lab, always everybody acquire in the same view. And then you have to see what measurement that you are doing. And in that, in that terms, I think that uh, maybe RV strain will be the one that is, that will have more reproducibility. Because if you get the same view and, and the, you can do it. I think uh, the heart model is also very, very dependent on the acquisition. And uh, it, it's complicated. Not everybody knows how to acquire it. So yeah, uh, that is definitely a problem of all the things that we do, uh, assessing serially the right ventricle is complicated. And I think that probably strain is the best one, but uh, even that will have uh, problems. Um, Roberto, here also we have a, a question from one of the attendees. What is your uh, impression or what is your opinion of the use of myocardial performance index, like the TIE index uh -huh. to evaluate the global performance? Okay, so the myocardial performance index, uh, as you all know, it's in the we it's uh, in the numerator. We add the isovolumic relaxation and the isovolumic contraction time, and we divide it by the ejection time. Uh, and there are probably two ways. And I mean, the advantage of how this index was sold was that it incorporates both systole and diastole, and that theoretically is an advantage. But uh, part, of a, part of the problem is that it's very difficult. You're talking about 35, 40 milliseconds. It's very difficult to measure consistently. If you acquire it with, a, you know, color tissue Doppler or with pulse Doppler, you will get different measurements for it. I think it's very, a, it maybe is even good for a publication, but I don't think so. I, I, we don't use it. And I think that with the tools we have today, we probably should not use it anymore because it's not consistent. Yeah, I, I agree with that also. And uh, what about what is in, in the TE, transophagia, sometimes it's not so easy to evaluate the, the right ventricle in 3D. So any tip on how to use that? Yeah, that is a very good, uh, also a very good question because uh, now that we all started to do interventions on the right ventricle, everybody was forced to learn very quickly how to assess the tricuspid valve and also to assess the the right ventricular shape. And I and I agree with you. I don't have any major tips to do a uh, 3D, uh, and even I would tell you that. We struggle, and I will tell you, I'm sure that everybody struggles to obtain good 
3D images of the tricuspid valve from a transesophageal point of view. It's much more easier to acquire from the transthoracic point of view. And sometimes we are still scratching our heads uh, when we are pointed out quickly, what valve is this and what should we clip? And is this the posterior anterior? It's, it's not easy. We're all learning, we're getting better, but uh, you have to practice a lot to, to, to make it happen. Yeah. And also I want to know, how do you evaluate right ventricular infarction? What is your protocol there in Chicago or any tip? Uh, well, we do, a, I think, a, a regular type of study. We definitely would like to, to get many different views to try and see if we can obtain a wall motion abnormalities of, of, of the right ventricle, but we don't particularly use a particular a protocol to uh, assess the right ventricle, just the, the regular uh, protocol that, uh, that we do. And during the stress echo, do you look also what happens in the right ventricle? Not if it's not, that also is a very good question. No, we, I mean, I'm telling you the truth, right? <laughs> the reality is that we, that we don't look at the right ventricle in a, in a stress echo, only in situations in which there is a, an idea that the pulmonary artery pressure might go up with exercise. In those type of situations, we do it, but we don't do it regularly in every study. Only if the pa person referring us a patient is telling us to, to look at that. If not, we don't. Okay. Uh, Cobalt, you want to show some? Yeah. Okay. I, I would like to know, um, there's another uh, another type of patients that uh, in which right ventricular function is essential, which is uh, congenital heart disease. Um, and that is tricky with ECHO too, because those patients, many of those are already operated, uh, maybe two or three previous surgery. Um, what do you do in, in those cases? Uh, do you refer those for MR or still you think that you can solve all questions with uh, with echo and uh, and again uh, do you have any specific uh, parameter you look at or, or as we were discussing to perform a comprehensive evaluation and so uh, that is a, again a very excellent question so um, you know we the the our hospital uh, is a hospital that is in the south side of chicago and we take care of mostly very low income African-American patients. And you have all heard about the inequality in of these poor patients in terms of things. So we frequently get patients with congenital heart disease in which the patient has been operated and so on. And, and the patient doesn't have any idea of what has happened to them. So you start doing an echo and it's the most complicated thing to, to do. We are lucky in our, in our lab, we have uh, two sonographers which are uh, pediatric uh, sonographers uh, by training. So we send these patients to them and they do most of the, um, most of the echo. We, in these patients, we do a lot of MRI because MRI seems to be extremely useful in doing that. And then what we do also, we, we bring, uh, when we get these patients, Sometimes I don't even know how to analyze them because it's too complicated. I sometimes cannot figure it all out. So we, we are lucky we have a adult congenital physicians and they actually do the studies with us and we have a conference and we, we yeah. analyze them with them. But uh, those are, in those patients, we mostly always use cardiac MRI. Perfect. I I have a last question for you, and then Kova can uh, ask uh, last questions or even from the audience. But my last question is, well, uh, related to the strain in right ventricle, do you think that we need an automatic way of, the, of doing this strain, or we should do it manually uh, to reduce or to obtain better results? What do you suggest? I think that, uh, that I mean, the software that you showed uh, at the beginning of the talk is a, a software that uh, automatically uh, positions itself. And in my experience, I find that unfrequently I need to modify it. Most of the time it, it sort of 
is in like here most of the time it's in a very good position and if you want to modify it is because you're either obsessive so what you're going to do by <laughs> trying to change that is you're going to ruin the curve because it doesn't really make for clinical purposes it's perfect so i think that an automated way is probably the way to go having the ability to change it because at times it, it doesn't work but in, in the vast majority of the times it works and I think that uh, this type of uh, AI sort of programs work uh, extremely well. Yeah, and in this uh, uh, setting, we have uh, two questions from the same person outside uh, Spain here. Do you measure the interdependence between both ventricles, which is the best way to assess both ventricles interdependence? And also a practical question is, in cases of severe right ventricular dysfunction, and significant TR, how do you apprise the pulmonary artery pressure? Okay, so let's start with the last one. In, in patients in which we have, let's assume, mild coaptation of the tricuspid valve leaflets, and you have severe tricuspid regurgitation. In that type of situation, the principles of the Bernoulli equation do not work. So you cannot use your TR jet to estimate your pulmonary artery. So we actually write that uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressures cannot be estimated from that particular study. If you want to, the, you have these uh, things that we learned many, many years ago, the 60-60 um, sign in which we look at the acceleration of the, of the pulmonic flow. If it's less than 60 uh, milliseconds, you know, or usually, and if you're, so those are type of things that can guide you to that. But I think that is a, sort of a problem. And the, and the first question was, if you can repeat it again. Yeah, the interdependence between- Yeah, the interdependence. So that is, we didn't talk about that. The interdependence is very important, mostly because I think we need to remember that the, you know, we, we talk about, I talked a little bit about the, longitudinal fibers in the subendocardium. But in the subepicardium, they are uh, circumferential fibers. And they are circumferential fibers that enclose both the left and right ventricle. And then of course, uh, the right and left ventricle are encased in the pericardium. And you know that during inspiration, you increase the blood return to the right side by around, uh, I don't know, it increases 20 to 30%, and there is a, a simultaneous reduction on the flow across the mitral valve. So there is definitely an interdependence, but mostly what we do is we look in the short axis at the movement of the septum and see if during inspiration it shifts or not. We don't truly measure it, but we, if we see it, we, we, we say it's present or not, but we don't have any quantitative measures of uh, interdependence. But it's very important to look at that, particularly when you have constriction or pericardial effusion, et cetera. It's uh, something that it's always, and then of course that leads to the respirophasic changes in flows and dopplers, and that's important to, to have in mind. Okay, thank you so much, Roberto. I think we have one last question before we, we close, which comes from uh, Dr. Chicale. Is there any difference in the image acquisition for strain and 3D when the right ventricle is severely dilated? Okay, so that is another good question. So um, the right, when the right ventricle is not dilated, so that means that the apex of the ventricle is made by the left ventricle. I think that the right ventricular focus view is the best to acquire a 3D. On the other hand, when you have a very dilated right ventricle, I think getting the 3D acquisition from more of a traditional apical four chamber view and moving the transducer cranially one intercostal space can help. So you have to figure it out. It's not exactly the same. There is not a law, but you have to find out. But different positions can help according to the right ventricle. For strain, I would stick with a right ventricular focus view independent of what type of right ventricular geometry you have. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, so we have uh, finished our chat today, Roberto. Uh, thank you, Kova. Thank you, Roberto. Indeed, it's a great pleasure that uh, a real expert, a means real that is not theoretical, as you have seen all in, in the different questions. So thank you for being with us. And we also want to invite you for next Monday that we will have uh, the email talks related to aortic calcification and Dr. Bernard Cosins will be the one chatting with all of us. So thank you, Roberto. And enjoy. Yeah. It has been very kind of you, uh, uh, both of you to invite me. I, I really uh, value our friendship and uh, I hope you all keep safe and well and we'll meet in person very soon. Excellent. Bye to all. Bye then. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.